بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Welcome everybody to the Safina Society Nothing But Facts podcast in which uh, today is Tuesday and on Tuesday as you know we study the uh, tafsir of the Quran and we read from one of the best tafsir okay. tafsir al-baghawi all right. Why is it one of the best? You always learn something, yet at the same time, it's not long-winded. Neither is it wajiz, very thin, uh, nor is it um, there's too much tawassa or expansion on every single little subject that would make you feel that you're not re- actually um, progressing in the reading. You know, tafsir is never about... Um, um, it's never really about advancing quickly in anything okay but here we are and we shall read from surah to taghabun that's segment number one segment number two i'm gonna read from critic uh the divine for critical minds again in inquiry into god's existence it's gonna be segment numero dos segment number three i'm gonna read from a du- a little dua book actually made for children but there, you should never see a dua book except that you read something from it, right? Read, and you never know which du'a is going to be accepted. And du'a is something that should never okay, be taken for granted, or, oh, I know this. It's not about knowing. Constantly, non-stop supplication is our way, and that is the way, that is what Allah wants from us. That is what Allah loves from us. Okay, so let's open up all the different chats to see who we got on board today. We had a great... Uh, audience yesterday and a lot of interaction on the stream okay and let us open up insta to make sure everyone's here by the way did you guys see moin you know moin from the from the original Sophie society podcast did you guys see moin's um the stuff that he's putting up on instagram he's become like a carpenter right He's become a carpenter. The Christians are going to get upset with you. You're rivaling their, you know. He's become a really, he's speak, he, it's impressive, I have to say. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qala ata hiya makkiyya illa thalathu ayatin. Illa thalatha ayatin. It is a Meccan surah. Okay. Surat at taghabun It's a Meccan surah minus three ayahs, which are, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu inna min azwajikum, until the end. Okay? So the last three ayahs are not, are from Medina. Okay? The last three ayahs are from Medina. The rest of the surah is Mecca. And he begins by saying, Regarding the first two ayat, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Yusabbihu lillahi ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard, lahu mulku wa lahu alhamdu wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir, huwa alladhi khalaqakum fa minkum kafirun wa minkum mu'min, wallahu bima ta'maluna basir. Qala ibn Abbas, inna allaha khalaqa bani adama mu'minan wa kafira, thumma yu'iduhum yawma al-qiyamati kima khalaqahum mu'minan wa kafira. He created you, all right? And some of you are mu'min and some of you are kafir. And that is always what uh, boggles the minds of many people who try to think about this. And sometimes I think they are looking for errors in the, in the deen and saying, oh, if Allah created me a kafir, then what's the point? We say to you, look, is your lived experience, do you have choices or not? A man came to one of the scholars and said this, so the scholar took a rock and he hit him with it, right? And, yeah, what are you doing this for? Because I'm asking questions. He said, it was written. It was destined that I throw a rock at you. He said, ah, it's not an excuse. Okay. So if it's not an excuse for me, it's not an excuse for you. What is the lived experience? Discussion over. The lived experience here is that we have choices. That's what matters. We have enough of that uh, will to render us innocent or guilty could you imagine if uh this you know uh, sense of pre or uh, predestination or this 
understanding or misunderstanding of predestination was admitted into law. Hitler's innocent then. Well, he's not guilty. There's no innocence in guilt. He just, that's just uh, his DNA made him do it. This is the Qadriya, the Qadriya, or sorry, the Jabriya. There's a group called the Jabriya way back in Islamic history. Jabr means force. We get the word algebra from that too. So if I say X plus three equals five, the equation forces X to be two, right? Two plus three equals five. So Jabr is force. So the Jabriya believed we're forced to do everything. Okay? That's what they believed. So uh, they were refuted. And the opposite side was the Qadriya. No. Every, even Allah doesn't uh, know what's going to happen tomorrow. We do our actions, all of our actions. So the, these are the two extremes. The Qadriya, no Qadr. And the Jabriya, everything is forced. Today, the Jabriya, we do have a new version of the Jabriya. And the new version of the Jabriya, they're, the, they're usually the biologists. And they hold that um, you are just wired to do what you're doing. Right? With your wiring, put in this setting, you're going to produce this result. With your, with your wiring, the way Habib is wired, given all the factors that he's been handed in life, he has no option except to, to do what he's doing now. Right? To react the way he's reacting now. We say, well, how do you know that? Right? They, they laugh off free will. That, that you have a free will, they laugh it off. So we do have a modern version of the Jabriya. The Ahl Sunnah state and the Aqidah of Islam states you do have enough of a choice in your actions within a set confines that Allah created for you, okay, to, to take action that renders you innocent or guilty. Okay, and and Allah knows this in advance. That's it. Okay, designed by Allah, Jabriya and Qadriya. Yes, you spelled it correctly. You got it right. Okay, so this is what we say: you have enough free will. All right, that you can be rendered innocent or guilty. And in Islam, we elevate free will very highly when it comes to our own action. And it does not in any way impugn the knowledge of Allah. That Allah has knowledge of what we were doing. And that our actions are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we, we earn them. It has what it earns. Okay? And Allah says, خَلَقَكُمْ وَمَا تَعْمَلُونَ He created you and your actions. These are two verses that, that outline our aqidah regarding God's knowledge predestination, and free will. So what do we have? Something called kasb. We do not create our own actions. Allah creates them, but we earn them by intending them. Okay? And the intentions, I may intend something, yet Allah doesn't create it. Right? How many, uh, how many times you try to do something and didn't do it? So you intended it, okay? But... Allah did not create it for you. So if it was a good deed, you get the good deed. You get the reward of the good deed. And if it was a bad deed, you don't get the reward, the punishment of the bad deed. So Allah says, لَهَا مَا كَسَبَتْ Whatsoever you intend, Allah give you a portion of that reward. And then if you did do it, that's called tawfiq. That you made a good intention and Allah gave you what you were looking for. Okay? Created it for you. So... And there are certain, there are things Allah commanded us to do, right? He, he, he created for us, whether we like it or not. Not commanded us, created it for us. Whether we like it or not. Such as us existing in this century. He didn't create, create for us to exist before or after. So that's why we said we're in a sandbox. Allah creates for us parameters. We are here obeying Allah or disobeying Him. I have the choice to obey or disobey, Okay. Here, at this moment, at this location, on this planet, let's say. The location, I could change my location if I wanted, right? But at this time, I can't change time. I can't change this planet. Right? Humanity is created on this planet, not on Neptune or Pluto, or Mercury or Venus. So we have parameters. Uh, Allah created me as this type of figure, created you as that figure, that figure. Everyone's created with their own figure, 
All right? No choice. Now you have choice in how you handle it. We talked about the Prophet Sallallahu yesterday, tending to his body. That's why you, a little bit off the subject, it is possible to demean or criticize appearances, right? And is not criticizing the creation of Allah. Because a person may have a terrible appearance. That's not how Allah, Allah didn't create you, all right, and, and disallow you to comb your hair, for example. Or trim your beard, or trim your hair, or iron your clothes. Right? Someone once said how terrible it is someone who is overweight. I said, don't make fun of the creation of Allah. And the person responded, Allah didn't create you overweight. You ate, and you didn't move. Right? So there is, within everything that Allah created for us, a little realm of control. Or we, shouldn't, we can say, kasp. We can take action in that. We can move in that. Right, so that's the basic understanding, the parameters of how we understand free will and God's knowledge. Okay, Wurwina and Ibn Abbas and Ubay ibn Kab, the great companion who is second most knowledgeable about the Quran after Ibn Abbas is Ubay ibn Kab. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The noble messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, إِنَّ الْغُلَامَ الَّذِي قَتْلَهُ الْخَدِرُ وَعَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ طُبِعَ كَافِرًا The youth that Khadr killed was made to be a kafir. Allah created him and stamped him as a kafir. Okay? Why is that? Because do not imagine that this is why it's so important, the tanzih. Okay? The tanzih. Of Allah from time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in the time that we live in. In the sense of experiencing past, present, and future. We are on a timeline because we are material things. Anything material must exist in a timeline. And there is no timeline without material things. Okay, Time, the timeline, is a, sub, is a, is a function of matter. Very simple thing. Time is a function of matter. If there's no matter, there's no time. If as soon as there's matter, there's time. This is what the, we call this makin. Makin is you exist in time space. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of that. Hence, he is munazza, transcendent from that. It's transcendent beyond time. Therefore, when Allah Ta'ala says a statement, when the Prophet Sallallahu says a statement like this, that Allah stamped that he's a kafir, okay, that is, not opposed, that is not forcing him. Because what Allah is deeming, okay, he is not living today and tomorrow the way we are, all right, he is seeing the final result. Okay, it's created with his knowledge already. The final result of your choices. So therefore... It is accurate and not con- uh, uh, contradictory to the, uh, the free will of a human being. It is a contradiction if you misunderstand Allah and you imagine that Allah is existing like us n- uh, today, not knowing about tomorrow, etc., etc. Okay? It's not, he is transcendent or munazza. Transcendent, the Arabic of that is munazza. Transcendent means beyond something. It does not apply to him at all. Okay. As they said, is God connected to the universe or disconnected? Is he near or far? We say the question is wrong. The question implies that he is material and somewhere hovering around the universe. So he is munazza, transcendent beyond this question. Transcendent. It does not apply to him because Allah is not composed of matter. So tenzi is, tran- is the concept of transcendence and munazza is the description of being transcendent. قَالَ جَلَّ ذِكْرُ وَلَا يَلِدُوا إِلَّا فَاجِرًا كَفَّارًا أَخْبَرَنَا عَبْدُ الْوَاحِدِ بْنُ أَحْمَدِ الْمَلِيحِ أَخْبَرَنَا أَحْمَدِ بْنُ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ النُّعَيْمِ أخبرنا محمد بن يوسف حدثنا محمد بن اسماعيل حدثنا سليمان بن حرب حدثنا حماد عن عبد عبيد الله بن أبي بكر بن أنس عن أنس عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال وكر الله بالرحم ملك ملكا فيقول اي ربي نطفه 
أي ربي علق أي ربي مضى فإذا أراد الله أن يقضي خلقها قال يا ربي أذكر أذكر أم أنثى أشقي أم سعيد فما الرزق فما الأجل فيكتب ذلك في بطن أمه Let's go first to the section and read or reread I don't care if you ever read it 50 times you should know. We, we part of our path in, in knowledge our philosophy is we never get bored If you find yourself getting bored of teaching something Unboard yourself quick. Take a breather from it, but then go back to it. Sure, we the, the concept of getting bored is the beginning of your failure. If you allow getting bored to dictate your actions, be prepared for failure. Okay. Let's go to the section on divine. Uh, on on. Let's see if there's in this book on aqidah the section on free will, predestination, and free will. Okay. It's on 268, a whole section. 268. That's what we do in this live stream. We read from the uh, heritage of knowledge that these scholars have cascaded down generation after generation, and that's how we're going to benefit by through knowledge. Okay, if Allah wills good for people, He gives them education. So here's what we're going to say. Okay, so He says here, reading from. The Introduction to Islamic Theology, Imam Nur al-Din al-Sabuni, Al-Bidaya fi Usul al-Din, translated by Faraz Khan. Excellent job. Contrary to the Ash'ari scholars, Ahmad Ali Tfadl, our fellow Maturidi state that it is not conceivable that God, the exalted place on his servant a burden, that that cannot be performed by them. This is because burdening someone incapable falls outside the scope of wisdom, like burning a blind person to see a paralyzed person or, or to, to see, or a paralyzed person to walk. Thus, it would not be attributed to the all-wise because it would be foolishness. To further elaborate, to burden is to require someone to do that which entails hardship as a test, such as that he is rewarded for its performance and punished for its non-performance. Okay? This can be actualized only in something conceivable, not something inconceivable. If it is said the God, the exalted states, our Lord, place not upon us a burden we cannot bear. Okay? So if an unbearable burden were not possible, seeking refuge from it would not be valid. Okay? So it's possible for it to happen. In, so when Allah states this ayah, do not burden us with something we cannot bear. Okay? And Allah states, He does not Burden a soul with what it cannot bear. What does this mean? This means sharia, obligations and prohibitions. Obligate you to, to, for example, not eat and drink for two weeks. You die. So the obligations. But is it fathomable that someone can be burdened with something that he cannot bear? Of course, how else is anyone killed or dead or sick? You can't bear the flu bug, you get sick. You can't bear a bullet to your head. You die, right? So that is possible from people. But it is not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, through the sharia. The sharia, the religion, does not teach us anything uh, or does not command us something that we cannot do. Okay? The first refuge, uh, the first, it says here, likewise God said to the angels, inform me of the names of these despite his knowing. Okay, similarly is related in narration that God, the exalted said, say, says on the day of arising to those who used to make pictures, give life to what you created. Of course, they can't do it. The first verse deals with seeking refuge from being given a physical burden that is unbearable, not a moral one. Okay? For it is conceivable to make someone carry a mountain or a wall he cannot hear. Okay? Cannot bear, such that he dies. Right, a brick fall, a brick wall falling on a person. He dies, so he couldn't bear it. Okay, torture all the time. People are tortured, right? People f- suffer far less than all these things. They can't bear it. Their brain fries. Literally, their f- brains are fried from the burden of life that they couldn't bear. Okay, and so you have situations where you walk around and you see people. They had to drug themselves from the pain, from the hardship, and and then their body couldn't bear the drugs. So we literally have, I'm not even kidding you, the zombie apocalypse, there is some truth to it. And it comes to the, in the form of drugged humans. 
And there are, huh? Yeah, but the, but even worse. Like the zombies, there are um, it places out in L.A., in California, where there's tents of homeless people who just do drugs day in and day out. If you ever go to one of these crack houses, you stop, they're zombies. They are so out of it. I don't even know how they're walking and drinking and going to the bathroom and whatever, right? They are out. When we used to feed the poor here, every once in a while, we'd see someone, they're not there. There is a person is not there at all. You give him food, he is not there. It's drugs, all right? And that's spreading. Yeah. Yeah. So then they started like grabbing me and like they actually were like like zombies. Yes. Yeah. Exactly, right? It's scary. It's freaky. And it's out there in California spreading and 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 if anything's spreading in California, they usually end up spreading the rest of the world. Uh what just happened? Camera just went off. We'll fix it. Hmm? Oh, but you have a different publication, do you? You have the CP have the PDF. Man, you hacked it? Two sixty nine. How'd you hack that? Um, all right. If it is said, did Allah not place upon Abu Jahl and Pharaoh the responsibility of believing while knowing all along that they would never believe? Is it not impossible for something to exist if it contradicts what is known to God the exalted? We respond. This question first entails divergence from unanimous consensus as well as denial of a statement of God the exalted. Regarding the former, the community, the ummah, has reached unanimous consensus that God never actually places a burden on anyone greater than his ability. No moral obligation that is beyond his cap- capacity. The difference of opinion is only that is in its logical possibility. Regarding the second, God the exalted states, God does not burden any soul except within its capacity. And the impossible is not within the capacity of anyone. Okay, So, his burden upon them to believe was possible for them. Okay, Yet knowing that they would not do it and is not forcing them to not do it. Okay? His knowledge that they will not do it, keep in mind, that statement itself is false. His knowledge that they will not do it. All the creation, all the knowledge, you cannot speak about Allah regarding past, present, and future. So they have, it's as if it already happened. In the sight of Allah, it's all already happened. So he's telling you the end of the book, right? But you, us humans have to live page by page. Okay. So if Allah is telling you that in the last chapter of your life, you're going to do X, Y, and Z, it's irrelevant to you. You are living on chapter five. I'm on decade number four, decade number three, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, right? You're still the author of your deeds, but for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's as if it's all done. Okay? So he's telling you what's in chapter 10 does not mean that you're forced. No one's forcing you. So this is one of the most important features here. Specifically regarding the statement, it is not impossible for something to exist if it contradicts what is known to God. We respond with the following, impossible is that which cannot be logically conceived, while possible is that which can be logically conceived. The existence of a non-existent of something is considered. All right. This is still not the answer that we're looking for or the debate that we're looking for. Okay. This is indicated by the fact that we are already, already in agreement that both the existence and non-existence of the cosmos are logically possible. Okay. While in the knowledge of Allah, it was certainly to come into existence. The reality of its current existence does not render it logically necessary. Since if what God knew to exist were deemed necessary, and what he knew to not exist were deemed impossible, there would be no actualization of that which could possibly exist. It's very it's sort of complex if you're a new reader to this. Actualization to come into existence. Moreover, divine will would then serve to distinguish the necessary from the impossible, rather than specify one logical possibility from another. This understanding is contrary to the position of all the logicians and metaphysicians. Now, if it is said, the notion that it is possible for something to exist if it contradicts what is known to God, 
I'm not going to read this. I'm going to go to the next section. On the generality of things will. You see, this live stream is actually doing you a great service. It's books. It's more like, like audio books, books on tape of various books in Ahl Sunnah, okay, being read to you and even explained to you. And it never keeps you bored. There's always a different book that we're reading from. Okay, and this section is very important from Surah at taghab that, that we expand in this and learn from it. The people of truth, may God grant them victory state that everything originated. Muhdath. Something created, something that came into existence. Okay? Whether substance or accident, good or evil, occurs by the decree and the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Mu'tazila, the Mu'tazila, which is a deviant sect, state that things not pleasing to God are not willed by Him. Okay? They differed among themselves regarding permissible things. We state that whatever God, the exalted, knows will exist, He wills for it to exist, regardless of whether He commands it or not. Abu Hanifa alluded to this when he asked one of the Qadarites, did God the exalted eternally know all the evil and vile things that would exist or not? Okay, good question. This is what uh, people say. Did God know all these bad things would exist? The person was forced to admit that God knew these things. He then asked, did God will to make manifest that which he knew as he knew it? Or did he will to make them manifest contrary to what he knew, whereby his knowledge would be rendered ignorance? The person then renounced his former position and repented to God for it. Okay, so let me read you the second question. Okay. Okay. He asked one of the Qadri, did God know all the evil and vile things in this world or not? And he said, yes, God knew them. He then asked, did God will to make manifest that which he knew? as he knew it or did he will to make the manifest contrary to what he knew whereby his knowledge would be rendered ignorance okay so he created them as he knew them to be which is something that has ghazali emphasizes later tawafuq ilm allah bi af'alihi wa kalamihi god's knowledge god's speech god's actions they're all in accord there's no diffusion between them all of his words are in accord to his knowledge. All of his actions are in accor- accord to his knowledge. Okay? And the word for that is muwafiq, in accord to his knowledge. There's no separation in it. Okay? For that reason, one of our fellow Maturidis stated, divine will corresponds to divine knowledge. Al-irada tajri ma'al ilm. We just said, his will his actions, his speech is in accord to his knowledge. The correct way of stating it, however, is that the divine will corresponds, okay, in accord. I said in accord, he says corresponds to divine actions. Al irada tajri ma'al fi'al. Meaning, whatever acts God, the exalted, undertakes were indeed willed by him. Okay. For that reason, the Shaykh Imam Abu Mansur al Maturidi stated that this issue derives from the issue of the creation of human action. Once we establish that all human actions are created by God, it then flows that they are willed by Him. Since if He did not will them, He would be coerced into bringing them into existence, which is impossible. Nothing is coercing the Creator. Okay? Allah says, And you do not will unless God wills. Okay? And His statement, Had God willed, they would not have ascribed partners to him. And his statement, had your Lord willed, all the people on earth, without exception, would have believed. The first one. Some verses, in fact, explicitly affirm that misguidance is also willed. He misguides whomever he wills. And whomever he chooses to misguide, he makes his chest narrow in anguish. Also, according to Sunni Orthodoxy, there is no difference between choice and will. The proof of the soundness of our position is that transmitted saying, that the community received with acceptance. Okay. That which God chooses exists. Okay. You know this, that's in the Awrad, right? To, to negate the Mu'tazilites. Okay. That which Allah chooses exists. And what He does not choose cannot exist. If Allah does not will or choose for something to exist, that thing will never exist. The position of our opponent 
contradicts the implication of the statement since some of what God chooses, okay, such as faith of all disbelievers, did not occur. And some, so some people say, hold on a second, did not Allah want everyone to believe? He commanded us all to believe, then, but they didn't believe. So here they're confusing his command with his will. Okay? He's going to say that soon. Okay? Did not uh, he command faith of all disbelievers? But it did not occur. Hence their position that divine will means that he wants something or prefers something, thus differs from choice or irad, is invalid by consensus. So his tashriya, his command, is different from his will. Right? He may command a thing and he doesn't will it. He commands a thing and wills it. He dis, uh, 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 does not command it or he disallows a thing and wills it. He disallows a thing and doesn't will it. And the examples they give on it is when he commands a thing and he wills it, the belief of the believer. He commands a thing but doesn't will it, the disbelief of the kafir. You're commanded to believe but he dis- disbelieves. So on and so forth. You've got two options so you have a box of four. He disallows a thing, but he creates it. He wills it. He disallows alcohol, but people get drunk all the time. He disallows a thing and he creates and he creates it. Uh, uh, doesn't create it, such as the kufr of the mu'min. Right? He does not allow us to make kufr, and he does not create it for us. Okay, so it's like a box of four. If it is said, if God chose disbelief for the disbeliever, he chose disbelief for the disbeliever the person would not be able to do other than God's will. That's the question we got to, right? If Allah willed for a person to be a kafir, then that person cannot possibly be a believer, right? Here's the beautiful thing of it. You don't know God's will. That's the thing. If a kafir says to me, hold on, if God wills for, you to be a, for me to be a kafir, how could I ever be a mu'min? We say, this is a moot point because you don't know God's will. You don't know Allah's will. Okay? That's the first thing. So, secondly, they're trying to say, I'm coerced by God's choice, by God's will. He should then either be excused for his disbelief, according to his own logic, which would nullify the divine command, okay? Promise, prohibition, or threat. Or he should be punished for it, which would entail accountability for what? exceeds capacity because no one can go against god so if god willed for me a calf be a calf but i can't go against him so why am i being punished that's the logic of this argument okay i guarantee you he covers this here rayhan rayhan uh, zaidi because this is a common question for a thinking muslim i get, get ahmed i know you want to read with us after we finish this find it in here okay, i guarantee you he covers it in here we respond. You want to know, people want to know what we're reading from. We're reading from this. We're then going to read from this. Okay? Let's see what he says here. We respond. We rebut your argument with the issue of knowledge in that if God knows he will disbelieve, is he then able to do other than what God knows or not? Your response with regard to the issue of knowledge is our response to the issue of will. Furthermore, our position is that although God wills disbelief for him, what God's, God wills is that the person chooses disbelief of his own volition. That's it. That's the answer. What did God will? God willed that you chose this. So God's will is over our will. So it's not as if God is willing and I'm willing, right? And Or only one of us is willing, sorry. God's willing or I'm willing. No, you are willing and God's willing that you're willing. Okay? Of your own volition and choice. God's will is that the person chooses disbelief out of his own volition and choice while having the ability to believe. This is also what God knows of the person. Thus, the divine command, prohibition, promise, and threat is valid. All that is valid. And that's the meaning of inshallah. Your will is also willed. You are never outside of the divine will. So if what is willed and known is an act based on choice, how can the doer be deemed coerced? Okay. In fact, God the Exalted explicitly mentions the servant's own volition in his statement, so whoever wants, let him believe. 
Okay. فمن شاء فل أن يؤمن فل شاء فليؤمن ومن شاء فليكفر. Okay. سورة what is that? الإسراء الكهف. فمن شاء فليؤمن ومن شاء فليكفر. وأعتدنا. As well as the statement, do as you wish. Do as you wish. Indeed, the servant necessarily knows that of himself. There is no way for him to deny it. That's where he goes to the practical aspect. You know that you have the choice. You can't deny that you have choices and that you take action. It's intuitive. Uh, before you came in, we said that one story, uh, a man questioned the same thing. So the scholar picked up a rock and threw it at his head and made him bleed. So he said, look at this sheikh. I asked him a hard question. He abuses me. He said, don't blame me. It was willed, right? I was willed to do it. And that was, so that was the answer, right? So you clearly intuitively know that you have choices. Yeah. I don't, I think it's, is there something le- less than Daruri knowledge? Bedihi, Fitri even? Because Daruri knowledge seems like there is still thought, like two plus two. Like it's it's a knowledge. This is like a badihi, right? It's like something that does not. It, I guess it would be daruri, but if there was anything less than daruri, be da, daruri. Is his mic on, by the way? No, we don't have a mic for him. But that's okay. Just speak up a little bit. Like, um, so like I know in the beginning of the video, he was just going, "Hey, Google, what is daruri knowledge?" Yeah. He gives the example like hunger or like thirst, like no badihi yet. Yeah. So he's saying daruri and badihiyat are the same. The word badihiyat is things that does, uh, that just by existing you know it's the case, right? All right, Ahmed, see if he has this discussion in this book, and we'll read it a second time. Okay. There is no way for him to deny, and God's will of the servant's action is established by both scripture and reason, so he cannot deny either of the two. You see how beneficial this was. Subhanallah. Let's underline this sentence right here. God's will is that he choose disbelief from his own volition. Okay? And I believe that's probably the end of this section. Now, one more chapter, one more question he says. If it is said, God the exalted states, and I have not created jinn and mankind except so as to worship me. He informs us that he created them for worship. How can he will their disbelief and disobedience? He likewise states God wants ease for you. He does not want difficulty and God does not will oppression for his servants. And we respond, as for the first verse, it cannot be applied generally since children and the insane do not worship him. Therefore, it must be interpreted appropriately. It's it's a general statement, but it has a limited application. There are two possible interpretations. One, it could mean except so as to be servants of mine, or it could mean I have not created whomever among jinn and mankind uh, that God knows will worship him except so as to worship me. Thus, generality is not intended and God knows best. As for the second verse, God wants ease for you and not difficulty. Or uh, God does not will oppression for his servants. That's the, the second verse what he mentioned is um, God wants ease, not difficulty. He says what is meant in that is that specifically with respect to the legislation of the law of the Sharia, okay, he does not want difficulty, but rather ease. As for the third verse, which is God does not will oppression for his servants, okay, what is meant is he does not will oppression for his servants, uh, that is, he does not oppress them but not that he does not will for some of them to oppress each other. Okay? All right? This is indicated by the fact that he does not state oppression of servants, rather oppression for servants. The preposition for here meaning against. As in his statement, and if you do evil, then you do it for yourselves. Okay? That is, then you do it against yourselves. Is that all clear? Heavy stuff, but extremely useful. Like, useful to an extreme. So I think we got the answer to that. Um, Ahmed is going to cover that up because Garen, I'm, I'm like 90% sure he must have covered this subject. Um, 
in his book. While Ahmed looks that up, okay, we will continue the tafsir of al-Baghawi on this matter. He says here that Allah Ta'ala has assigned an angel to every uh, womb. And that angel fashions and, de- and writes down w- w- the decree that Allah has for this creation. وَقَالَ جَمَاعَةٌ مَعْنَ الْآيَةِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَلَقَ الْخَلْقَ ثُمَّ كَفَرُوا وَآمَنُوا لِأَنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى ذَكَّرَ الْخَلْقَ ثُمَّ وَصَفَهُمْ بِفِعْلِهِمْ Okay. Is that Allah is in this describing their own actions, not enforcing something upon them. As Allah says, فَمِنْكُمْ كَافِرٌ وَمِنْكُمْ مُؤْمِنٌ وَاللَّهُ خَلَقَ كُلَّ دَابَّةٍ مِّمَّا فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَمْشِ عَلَى بَطْنِهِ Right? So Allah says, Allah created every animal from water. Some of them walk on their stomach. Some of them walk on four, four legs, etc. Okay? That is their description. He's just describing them, not forcing them. He's describing their own choice. Okay? فَرُوِيَ عَنْ أَبِي سَعِيدٍ الْخُدِرِي أَنَّهُ قَالْ فَمِنْكُمْ كَافِرْ فِي حَيَاتِهِ مُؤْمِنْ فِي الْعَاقِبَةِ فَمِنْكُمْ كَافِرْ وَمِنْكُمْ مُؤْمِنْ He, uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said, you're a kafir in this life, but when you go into the next life, you're going to be a believer. And some people could respond to that by saying that there's no belief in the afterlife because belief requires accepting the transmission of what you don't see, right? But on the Day of Judgment, you see it all. So you, there will be no believers on the Day of Judgment, and Allah knows best. وَمِنْكُمْ مُؤْمِنْ فِي حَيَاتِهِ كَافِرْ فِي الْعَاقِبَةِ وَقَالَ عَطَاءِ إِبْنَ أَبِي رَبَاحِ فَمِنْكُمْ كَافِرْ بِاللَّهِ وَمُؤْمِنْ بِالْكَوَاكِبِ وَمِنْكُمْ مُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ وَكَافِرْ بِالْكَوَاكِبِ uh, And, or he means by this, munafiqeen. The appearance of a believer in this life, but in the next life with the kafir, and vice versa. منكم وقيل فمنكم كافر بأن الله تعالى خلقه وهو مذهب الدهرية ومنكم مؤمن بأن الله خلقه and there are people who are kafir kafir uh, in regard to Allah creating them and that's a group called the Dahriya in the past there was a people called we've said we've been around here forever and nothing will destroy us except time so um, uh that's a group called the Dahriya. Did you find it, Ahmed? Okay. No mention of the free will debate here. Yeah. Okay. Omar Abbasi says. Uh, isn't belie- doesn't belief also apply to the observed, i.e. the Quraysh rejecting the Prophet وسلم, even after seeing his miracles? Well, I think what they are rejecting, they see the Prophet وسلم, they see his miracles, they're rejecting that it's from Allah. They still don't see Allah, right? So that's what they're rejecting. Allah knows best. But the, we also are told that the uh, kafir, if he was to see the truth itself, he would reject it. Right? Let me take a peek at this. Here it says, uh, monotheistic uh, coherence. Uh, Christians and Jews anticipate Muhammad. Muhammad mentioned by name. The paraclete of the Bible. This is so good. We're going to read a section from this. Is there evidence for God, logic, apparent design? My journey. Um... Mathematical symmetry in nature, nature's simple math, how does evolutionary theory fit? Adam and Eve, biochemistry, kinds of hadith, conquest of Constantinople, Mongols, tall buildings hadith, preservation of hadith, satanic uh, insertions, western hangups about Muhammad's marriages. What? Love wins. Why are you getting, getting involved? Why are they even getting involved in prophets' marriages? Love wins. How would you know anything about Sayyid Aisha's age from herself? She's the one who told you. Right? It's multiple times, by the way. Like the hadith of Ifk. She says, I was like very young. In Bukhari, she says her age. Why are you guys getting involved? Right? 
love wins. Isn't that what you guys say when when it's something against the biblical religious? Love is love. So don't get, don't get involved. Why are you getting involved? Did her dad get involved? Did her mom get involved? Oh, we're going to go that route now where the Democrats think that they're trying to undermine parental, like the new progressives, and they're trying to uh, undermine parental authority. Be careful of this. They're like parents. Who, who, who's to say a parent knows best for your kid? The state could know better. Anyone else could know better. So be careful from these, these lunatics. And they're, they're getting authority too. It's a problem. Let's get back to our reading. وَجُمْلَةُ الْقَوْلِ فِي أَنَّ اللَّهَ خَلَقَ الْكَافِرِ وَكُفْرُهُ فِعْلٌ لَهُ وَكَسْبٌ Allah created the kafir and his kufr is his own action and kasb. وَخَلَقَ الْمُؤْمِنُ وَإِمَانُهُ فِعْلٌ لَهُ وَكَسْبٌ He created the mu'min and his iman is his action and his kasb. فَلِكُلِّ وَاحِدٍ مِّنْ من الفريقين كسب واختيار. Each of the two groups, he has his own free will and his own choice. وكسبه واختياره بتقدير الله ومشيئته. His own will and his كسب and his action is from Allah's will and his predestination. فالمؤمن بعد خلق الله إياه يختار الإيمان. لأن الله تعالى أراد ذلك منه. Allah willed it for him to choose iman. وقدر قدره عليه. And Allah chose for him. To willfully choose Iman for himself. And same for the kafir. Allah willed for him to willfully choose for himself Iman. Okay? The exact same thing that is said here. Exact same thing. Like almost word, not word for word, but the same concept. And he's an Ash'ari Baghawi, he's an Ash'ari Shafi, and he's a Maturidi, I believe Hanafi, right? Yeah. Is there non Hanafi Maturidis at all? It just happened to be that they're all Ahnaf. And there's no shart. There's no reason a Shafi cannot become a Maturidi except that all of a sudden you, you mess up your teachers. Right? Because uh, part of this thing is the unicity of your teachers. Right? So you have a Jama'ah in, in Morocco and you want to be a Maturidi, you won't find one. Right? Especially in the old days. In well, modern times, everything is off because uh, teachers are everywhere. Right? But in the old days... So you gen- generally you tend to find these these things, and it's it's probably not good. I don't think. Um, I, I think it's by the intent. A person should not intend to to cook up for himself some kind of identity in these things that never existed and had no reason to exist. Like I'm this when it comes to this subject. I'm this when it comes to that subject. It's like. Yeah, on this subject, on this... On th- it just seems to be like you're trying to get attention. That's what it seems to me, and Allah, Allah knows the best, but it seems to me that you're just go- you're going that route of attention. Like, they, not not like to say, like, oh, like, every single... Like, every other issue, they're like, Maturidi Ash'ari, Maturidi Ash'ari. And like, they sit, they'll uh, accept the majority of one of the school. Yeah. But, like, they'll say, like... The, but. Uh, they'll say about like one masala like I incline towards the more the maturi. Yeah, I don't think I don't think there's a problem with that. Yeah, but it's when like uh, when it comes to masail of food, I'm this. When it comes to usul, I'm that. When it comes to aqidah, I'm this. And it's like it seems like your intention. What's your intention? Are it's you just like a Frankenstein cook? of. Um, yeah, you're trying art. to cook up a new identity <laughs> here or get attention, but yeah. uh, then now the asha'ira yeah. exists in all four methods. Maliki and Shafi goes without say. Yeah. There are Hanbali Ash'aris mm. or who lean towards that, such as Ibn al-Jawzi. And there are um, Ahnaf or Ash'aris in Shem, all over Syria. They have that. Ahnaf or Ash'aris. Um, okay. But the Maturidis, I believe, are solely, historically speaking, not today, historically speaking, within the Hanafi circles. Okay. He then says, هذا طريق أهل السنة والجماعة من من سلكه أصاب الحق وسلم من الجبر والقدر. Okay. لأن الله تعالى أراد ذلك منه وقدره عليه وعلمه منه. Okay. خلق السماوات والأرض بالحق وصوركم فأحسن صوركم وإليه المصير 
يعلم ما في السماوات والارض ويعلم ما تسرون وما تعلنون والله عليم بذات الصدور الله نا now speaks about his creation and his knowledge okay again that his creation as is his speech is always in a, and his will is always in accord with his knowledge these four never separate his fi'l his khalq okay his fi'l his irada and his kalam all right قدرة إرادة كلام كله موافق ويجري مع علمه. They're in accordance with his knowledge. They never separate these four from each other. Okay. ولم يقل يهدينا لأن البشر وإن كان لفظه واحد فإنه في معنى الجمع. لأنه كانت تأتيهم رسلهم بالبيانات فقالوا أبشر يهدوننا. The people said, will a human being guide us? Okay, he's on AS6. He didn't have much commentary uh, about AS3 to 5. So he goes to AS6. ذلك بأنه كانت تتيهم رسلهم بالبينات. Prophets used to come, messengers used to come to them with the proofs. فقالوا, the reaction was, أبشر يهدوننا. Will a human being guide us? ولم يقل يهدينا. لأن البشر وإن كان لفظه واحد فإنه في معنى الجمع وهو اسم الجنس لا واحد له من لفظه The word بشر is اسم لجنس It's the name of a whole genus And there is no single of بشر So أنا بشر ونحن بشر I am a بشر, we are all بشر right? There's no singular to it So what he says here لا واحد له من لفظه وواحده إنسان The singular of بشر is إنسان ومعناه ينكرون ويقولون آدمي مثلنا يهدينا Will a human be, they negate that a human being like us can, can guide us? How can one single human guide us? Or, or how can a human like us guide us? فكفروا وتولوا واستغنى الله عن إيمانهم فكفروا وتولوا They rejected, they turned back واستغنى الله Allah does not need them in the advancement of his will Okay. والله غني حميد عن خلقه في أفعاله ثم أخبر عن إنكارهم البعث Let's stop here Actually you know what mm. I fear that if we stop here I won't know where we left off But let's stop here and, and read from from Zaidi's book Okay So How can a human being guide if it is said that only Allah guides? Hmm? How can it be said that Allah how how can it be said that a human being guides if we know that only Allah guides? Okay, so it is the description, the uh, the speech about the sabab, yeah. in the same way that we speak about the musabib. Yeah. That's possible. Firstly, to, for those who don't know, what is a sabab and a musabib? The musabib, the creator of all causes, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's not a cause. He's a creator of the causes. And then the cause. And it is permissible in speech to refer to the cause and the creator with the same language, right? So I could say, if you save me from a river, I could say, you save me, right? While believing in my heart that you are the cause, not the creator of the saving. And ultimately, Allah saved me, okay? Um, that's correct on one facet. That's one answer that, that works. Another answer that works is that the guidance of the human is to point people to the actions through which Allah guides you, right? So a human guide would be the one who takes you to the well, but he can't make you drink. Or we can say the human guide is the one who teaches you how to pray, right? Then when you do pray, then Allah guides you. So Allah is the guide of your heart, but who guided your body to prayer? The human guide. And that's how we can call humans guides. There's nothing wrong to say that. The human is a guide. 
Okay. My love story with God begins in my teens, though I didn't know it at the time, since my high school in Canada, where I was born and raised, was a huge multicultural salad. The spectrum of beliefs prodded me subconsciously. I found myself hanging out with Sikhs and Hindus at lunch, and high-fiving Catholics and Protestants and Orthodox Christians at basketball practice, and discussing Buddhism and Sufism and every other ism over donuts at coffee shops. They were eye-opening experiences, but naturally these interactions made me wonder where I stood. I figured I should learn something about my religion, the religion of my ancestors, Islam. Having been viciously bullied when I was younger, I was inspired by the religion's proclaimed prophet Muhammad wasallam, an underprivileged orphan who remained at the servants of the weak despite triumphing over powerful oppressors. I remember staying up full nights engulfed in his biography. Though I was drawn to Islam due to its messenger and its lofty principle, I had not explored its theology deeply. Belief to me was something relative, like taste and clothing. However, I did not think God was a matter of fact, a belief everyone shared. I did think, sorry, I did think God, we just made tech feud of the guy. Stop. I did think, <laughs> would you remember, made the, the poor guy a kafir. I did think God was a matter of fact, a belief everyone shared. He, he just assumed that uh, that's, uh, everyone believes. Then I met atheists. These people asked me why I believed what I did, and I appreciated them for it. It compelled me to question all my beliefs and how rational they were. I checked them epistemologically, assessing how we can be certain of what we think we know about God's messengers, holy scriptures, and other ancillary subjects too. The biggest question, however, was whether God even existed. All this to me was in the spirit of inquiry. I figured that pushing all my beliefs through a scientific method, which I hold high, would certainly reveal whatever truth there was, and I was prepared to let the chips fall where they may. Oddly, it led me to a profound respect for theism. I say oddly because many of the atheists I had known over the years were now a hint more condescending, and I was actually expecting that I would adopt their view. But un by university, college, most people I met uh, thought that the, rational support, the rationale supporting atheism untouchably outstripped the one supporting a divine being. They went so far as to say that theists were enemies of reason and science, following a weak and dated belief. Today, this view of God seems to be widely accepted. Even theists have kowtowed. It's as if they too think that all God has going for him is faith. Given my own explorative journey, though I find this position grossly ignorant, I think it is, is us rolling our eyes at philosophy, theology, and logic that has led to this warped outlook. This is a summary of the book, right? The Western mind, all they look at is the visible data, al-ilm tajribi By limiting themselves to only what is de demonstrable and rolling your eyes at transmitted knowledge and rational knowledge, you will end up with very little certainty about these big matters. So he's saying here, that's the real problem in the Western civilization, is that they have pretty much dismissed okay, rational knowledge and transmitted knowledge. All right, I think it is us rolling our eyes at philosophy, theology, and logic that has led to this warped outlook. No less to blame is our aggrandizing, if not leaping up aboard, the apparent ironclad bandwagon of scientism. Scientism is the belief that Truth is restricted to that which can be demonstrated. Okay? Which we say, no, truth can be demonstrated, it could be reasoned, and it could be transmitted. Okay, from the past. Uh, scientism, whose tires we have not given a solid kick. But it is not all our fault. God has the best case with the worst lawyers. That's totally true. Where are the theologians? Theists fail to deliver. That is why it is my hope that this book will convey the strength of the platform on which the concept of God rests. Note that I am not arguing for what is true. That is another investigation. I would rather consider it a success if my work merely challenges readers 
to evaluate whether their position is as reasonable as pointing an omnipresent and creating uh, creating deity, or whether their position is as reasonable as positing an omnipresent and creating deity. We need to pass this milestone if we wish to embark on what is, in my opinion, the far more beautiful journey, the journey unto the divine. This is a modern kalam work, okay, put in a language we could all read and understand, okay, and that's why. I was like, this, it's almost like, this is the book I'm reading from everybody, okay? It's as if this book it has the same principles as the Safin Society podcast and Anthem of Facts live stream. That was the whole presentation of the Safin Society, the, the, the philosophy of the Safin Society podcast was that it was a kalam podcast. More so than fiqh or tasawf, it was about iman and reason, belief and reason. Okay. Yeah, there's like, uh, we were reading the Bidayat al Masuddin uh, from uh, with Sheikh Murad yesterday, and we were like reading from the translation, and like there's all these big words like ontological and like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like, and like we were just like, yo, like, are they just putting it ontological and like, like sprinkling yeah. in like, vo like scholarly vocab or like yeah. academic vocab? Like, we were just like all trying to like figure out what he was trying to say. But, yeah. But mashallah, like, this is easier. Yeah. So like, when you're a specialist in a field, yeah. you take the lingo. The technical terminology of that field for granted yeah and some people become they ha they're limited actually yeah. i think they're limited that they may stay in a field for so long right and be surrounded by the people of those that fields that they no longer remember like, what it's like to be ignorant of that field yeah i think that's so. a limit yeah because even the i think it was einstein who made that statement he said that you truly have knowledge if you can ex go through an entire f discipline, become an expert, yet explain it to the ignorant, yeah. right? That's where you like you you want the journey, but you haven't forgotten what it's like, yeah. and that's why, for example, um, uh, in uh, in politics, how is it that tyrants or kings collapse? Why would they collapse? How do they collapse? Is because they've been kings for so long. Right, that they don't have any knowledge or recognition of the life of the common man. Hence, they make decision after decision that hurts the common man. They have no access to the common man anymore. They make such blunderous decisions because they don't even have a clue how the common man lives, feels, or thinks. And, and then they, boom, within, uh, they make these clear blunders uh, that get them kicked out so that's the concept again people ask them what book we're reading from we'll be reading from this okay let's um just read another section here because um oh look look i'm telling you specials don't think right <laughs> look at look at the chapter look at what the chapter is called <laughs> specialists don't think right unreal <laughs> it's uncanny Right, must agree on a lot of them. Let's skip this section and go read to that section right away because I'm really curious what he said. Many people I meet have wondered why I believe in God. Some people ask, but most people don't. Okay, some people ask, semicolon, but most people don't. Their curiosity, I imagine, is the same. How can anybody be so sure God exists? Has this guy just been indoctrinated, or maybe it works for him, but there's no real way to know, is there? I don't usually get a chance to answer these questions. Existential questions are not automatic turnoff, are an automatic turnoff nowadays, even though everybody longs for answers. Okay, why we exist and all that stuff. It's not fashionable to ask these questions these days, but everyone truly wants to know. As for those with whom I have had enough time to kick back and just speak openly, usually friends who are not afraid to be critical of themselves or me, they most always, almost always end up remarking something to the effect of, if it's so rational, why doesn't everyone believe in God? Okay. Mm -hmm. there are, hey, hey, could you put the, you put in the link, right, Habib? Yeah. Good, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And for the YouTubers, the link to purchase yeah. it. There are a number of reasons why people do not accept the concept of a divine being. There are those who carry baggage from certain past experiences. Others are allergic to religion. Being able to do little on these two fronts, this book is not for them 
Okay, if you have an emotional, if you're emotional, you got some emotional issues, yeah. no offense, but it, you, you can't talk to you. You're biased. What we call, not as biased, hysterical. Oh, hysterical. Yeah, people are hyst- emotional, get hysterical, we can't deal with them. Mm-hmm. But most people have other reasons, and to whom this book may appeal. Yeah. Hey, those who deem sense experience the only reliable source of knowledge, that's scientism. The demonstrable sensory experience is the only source of knowledge. In other words, those who say, if God exists, why can't he be more obvious? Why can't I see him directly? Okay? Those who do not see God as a necessary explanation. Those who have not challenged their own framework strongly. Which is true of any of us who follow belief system, not just atheism. So like a Christian person who is Christian, but if you ask him, hey, you're so into this, but did you ever study anything else? No. And there are a lot of that in the Protestant camp. Okay. Those who have accepted the views of people believed to be smarter than themselves. Okay. People who, are, who, who watch um, Neil deGrasse Tyson think he's so smart, right? Can't be wrong. Or what's that other guy's name? Jordan Peterson? No. Oh, uh, oh um, what's it called? That atheist from England. Oh, Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins. Those who have accepted the view of people they believe smarter at this point is particular to atheists in our current scientific milieu, mm. right? You ask everyone, okay, well, evolution? Have you ever seen it? Oh, no, but scientists saw it. Where? They're all going to tell me, what's that? The fossil. Finches. Oh, wait, oh, the, finches. the birds, right? Those oh, yeah, birds. What are those yeah. birds called in the Galapagos Islands? Really? You're transmitting that? Everyone says that same example. The finches of the Galapagos Islands. Okay. Okay, the, the first group who say God does not exist because they have not seen him, suffer the same as anybody who claims that they do not see, uh, that what they do not see does not exist. It is the weakest form of reasoning. But the last category, those who follow what they perceive are beliefs of smarter people, are the ones I have the greatest objection with. Today, that often ends up meaning intellectuals in popular hard sciences such as uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, education. There are a number of reasons why following their belief is dangerous. Academic achievement is not inherently joined at the hip with atheism, but actually it does not matter even if it were. An idea being vogue within the scientific community does not make it true. Otherwise, that would have been a valid reason for believing that Jesus was God 100 years ago when most scientists were Christians. Scientists, we find, are no different than any of us whose conclusions are deeply influenced by personal interests, beliefs, and wishes. See, for example, Ian Sample's book, Nobel Winners Declare, uh, Nobel Winner Declares Boycott of Top Scientific Journals. Okay? Even the peer reviewing process does not escape these biases. Okay? But since 93% of leading scientists have been rejecting any form of religion or, super, uh, or spirituality, their influence on what scientific journals publish and what information the public receives is very real. Okay? Within the academic milieu of atheism, for example, were published the findings of Mark Hauser, former Harvard professor. His research demonstrated the moral superiority of atheists. Moral. In a twist of irony, Hauser became the embodiment of his own premises defeat he was notoriously caught for fraudulent research. SubhanAllah. Unbelievable. <laughs> SubhanAllah. But it was not that an atheist had been manipulating uh, the truth, which was alarming, but rather how errors ra- readily pass academic checkpoints as long as they conform to the scientific community's desired conclusions. Okay? And he gives examples. He, it's all footnoted. There's footnotes everywhere in the book. He's basically done something that I would not have had the sub to do. To go get footnotes and, you know. It is those views that crowd out the others. According to the philosopher of science, Ilja Masso, most scientists employ the scientific method based on materialistic, mechanistic, and reductionist assumptions. So much so that research find fundings are affected. The more a vision deviates from the materialistic paradigm, the lower its status and the less money it receives. It is due to these leanings, says top-ranking biologist Rupert Sheldrake, whose many well-documented and peer-reviewed research papers run counter to the ideology of the community to which he belongs, that a belief in materialism has indeed been propagated with remarkable success. Millions of people 
have been converted to the scientific view. They are, as it were, devotees of the Church of Science or of Scientism, of which scientists are the priests. I believe we must be aware of the biases of scientists whom we put on pedestals before we adopt their beliefs. They're human beings. Yeah. They have biases. Yeah. They have a philosophy. They have a desired conclusion. Like all this stuff with uh, Neanderthal man and all these things. I always say to them, guys, these guys have a conclusion in mind. Then they sew the evidence together. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. Okay. I believe we must be aware of these biases of scientists whom we put on a pedestal before we adopt their beliefs. Sociology of science confirms that uncritically adopting anyone's view within their field of authority let alone outside their field of authority, is risky. It subjects us to incorrect conclusions. So do not be surprised if throughout your reading you catch yourself wondering how that which is making sense to you is at odds with what smart people may have concluded. Thinking for ourselves is a good thing. Actually, it is more intellectually rigorous to formulate an opinion based on information than to follow an authority. Okay? Okay specialists don't think right he says okay apart from their mortifying bias i just read the wrong chapter by the way specialists don't think right was not what i was reading i was reading why people are atheists i don't know how i i skipped that okay but in other words right. apart from the mortifying bias there is another downside to accepting the beliefs of scientists unchecked specialization is specialization forces them to think in a vacuum specialization is a prized goal in scientific endeavor but learning more and more about less and less until we know almost everything about almost nothing has its pitfalls okay for one our findings may be irrelevant to the real world take how a pharmaceutical agent may alter an enzymatic pathway in the body as an example the drug may elicit the desired change at the biochemical level in a controlled lab environment but it may not produce any clinical significant outcomes yeah. in test subjects. In other words, yeah. years of successful research does not actually lead to any real life benefit. This is why yeah. we have on-site classes for teens. We have youth night, yeah. we have soup kitchen, we have dawa, we have live stream, so that when people go to Dar al and study, they do not spend years and years and then come out realizing, oh, this was irrelevant, yeah. right? I have to relearn how to live now and how people think. I literally took this just this year. I like what he was describing about like um, this when you study a drug. They, yeah. They study like yeah, sure, it's effective, but now is it clinically like relevant? Is it going to work? Is it like is it practical? Like yeah. essentially, like are you going to give like is is it going to be like thirteen shots like a patient has to uh, take? I see. Or is it like just one pill? Like, so, yeah. like they can take like in the beginning of the day. Is it pragmatic? Yeah. You know the guys at the top are always the super pragmatists. Yeah. That's why they're making the decisions. Yeah. Okay. That is not to discount the immense benefit that we all enjoy as a result of academic inquiry. In other words, nerds are good. They are used to nerds. Okay? <laughs> but we must be wary when specialists claim that their specialized discovery has certain applicability in larger context. This question of when a reduced finding can be appropriately generalized is a challenge that scientists have wrestled with since the 19th century, says Shell Drake. Those who believe in reductionism say that the whole can be understood by focusing on a part, that the whole is not greater than what is composed of it. They are inclined to generalize limited findings to mean more than they actually may. As specialists dedicate a lifetime looking through a microscope, it may be understandable that they are inclined to reductionist analysis. After all, there are instances when it does. One brick can teach us all we need to know about an entire wall but reductionism does not always work so well. The inherent flaw of reductionism and generalization was portrayed in a parable by the 13th century Eastern mystic Rumi and more recently by the English writer John Godfrey Sachs in his famous story of the blind men and the elephant. Basically, as such, as each of the blind men touches only one part of the elephant, he presumes that part is he is examining to represent the whole animal. The man who touches the tail declares the elephant must be like a snake. The one who feels a leg, he says it must be like a tree, like a pillar. Uh, and the one at the massive side, he says it's like a wall. The elephant is like a wall. Essentially, each man is a specialist in the part he analyzes. The analogy portrays how someone focused intently may not see the greater image. 
Okay, it can be related to how scientists who focus on one area of study are not in a position to comment effectively beyond it. So, to do so, they would need to consider the fields of it. Don't they always come to us? You're an imam. Stop talking about economics and riba. Just stick to uh, tahara and salah and wudu, right? That's what they always say whenever someone says anything about riba. The guy whose whole business is based on riba comes and says, listen, I know you're an imam, but you don't understand economics. No, I don't understand your contracts. No, that I don't understand. All those derivatives and all that stuff of your stocks and your contracts. No, that I don't understand. But what Allah said about it, that I do understand. Right? I do understand that Allah said this kinds of trades are haram. So you then apply that to your contract now. Likewise, when they say, the, the evolutionists, when, when we say in Islam, Allah created Adam directly without an antecedent. That's a fact. Right? In the Quran. Oh, you don't understand evolution? I don't need to. Right? <laughs> when it comes to where Adam came from, I don't need to understand that field. They are not an authority on where Adam came from. They're speculating. At the best they can ever get is a speculative answer, right? Because you weren't there. Think about it just epistemologically. Epistemologically, you were not there. The best you could do is a very, very good case for how the first human being came about. Maximum, it will be vanni, okay? Extremely speculative. Not even vanni. Shekki or wehmi, right? Wehmi, awham, imaginations. Okay, filling in the blanks of the, of the fossils. Um, like dinosaurs? Yeah. Probably, maybe they looked like that, maybe not. They're filling in a lot of blanks. I was so like shocked. You get to the dinosaur, you see one color and some bones are another color. Hey, why is that? Cone? I was just telling you that that was the bone and that's like a filler. Yeah, because they didn't have all the bones. He filled in the blanks, right? So, ohem. Ohem is when you have l like less than... 50 less than 49 percent likelihood it's like or, or even less than that far less than that shek is like 50 50 van is more 51 percent or more yaqeen is 100 percent well as a muslim i'm not talking to the non-believers here I'm talking to the muslims the quran is provides yaqeen and when allah repeats something over and over with language that cannot be interpreted away I have absolute yaqeen that Allah created Adam without an antecedent. An antecedent like a mother or a father, right? Huh? Or an amoeba or anything, right? And that was my whole debate with another da'iyah, right? A long time ago. And I don't even know where he stands on it. And he said, Allah is not a statue maker. We said, yes, Adam was a statue. He was hard like this. Salsal in kal It's in the book. It's in the Quran. Salsal and Kalfakar, you can knock on him like that. You could do that to Adam at one point. And when is a mammal ever Salsal and Kalfakar? In the development of a mammal. When they're dead, right? <laughs> and even that you can't knock. Right? It all powder, shatter into, into pieces, right? So Salsal and Kalfakar, go explain it. Right? And I'm not this is this like my theory of Adam's existence? Or is this like the entire Ummah? Go look at any tafsir. Adam was fashioned and he was made and he was clay and hollow on the inside. You could knock on him and there was like an echo too. Because we have hollowness, right? There's hollowness in the human being. So um, this person was saying, no, that he had an antecedent, right? No, even if you did, even if a Muslim evolutionist, firstly, your marriage is nullified, you're a kafir. Yours in deep. That belief is yours in deep. Muslim evolutionist. Okay. And by the way, some people say, no, 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 he's a Muptada only. Okay, fair enough. Uh, whatever. You are way out there, whether you're like a home run, it's past the wall, right? Whether it's out of the park, section one, section two, or out of the park, you're out, right? Of the truth. You're far from the truth. Okay. Because uh, I remember debating with my friend, is the Muslim evolutionist, he said that it's a bit amufasika according to his scholars, but according to who I took from it's better mukaffira it's khati and it's mutawatir yani it's ma'lum in ad-din bi-dharura God created Adam next if you were to scientifically explain that Adam came from this animal who came from this animal who came from this animal wouldn't you still have to come to something in which Allah says kun fayakun right so why are you kicking the can down the road why would it be difficult for Allah to create a particle you don't find it difficult. Eventually, you're going to have to, at least Allah will say, kun 
for a particle to exist, right? What is the difference for Allah to say kun for a particle or a human being or an entire universe? It's the same for Allah, right? All of it could exist in the blink of an eye and less than that. By saying kun, a particle could exist, a whole human could exist, an entire society with a universe and a world could exist when Allah says kun. What's the difference? As a hard to believe as a Muslim. In any event, Essentially, each man is a specialist in the part and they portray the whole to be uh, what they imagined and they do not see the greater image. It can be related to how scientists who focus on one area of study are not in a position to comment uh, effectively beyond it. To do so, they would need to consider the fields of others. Okay. Uh, to give you another example of this, um, someone says to you, is the um, Hindu God, is he real? And you say, no, it's kufr. And it's not real. He says, yeah, but you don't know anything about the Hindu gods. What do I need to know? Right? <laughs> All I need to know is that in Islam, sh we don't have shirk. All these idols are false. I don't need to know any information about your idols except that you worship it. Then it's, I can say it's false. It's a false god. Okay? To do so, they would need to consider other fields. It is to this that psychiatry